over here. Get in here. Hurry up. I didn't see the attitude of 41. I didn't see the attitude of 49. I didn't see an attitude of 57. I didn't see much of anything at 65 other than trying to keep the match close. 74, I didn't see any attitude. And we're in, a, we're in matches, right? That sucked, some of those matches. I don't know. I, it was just, wasn't good. I wasn't crazy about last week, really. You're going to have to get tougher. You're not tough enough. If I got somebody that's threatened me, I am not going to let him stay in the match. I'm going to take the match. I have to take it. I can't, I can't let him stay in the match. I got to go take it from him. But we, we let people wrestle with us today. You're way better than that. Displaying a technique on that leg race by John Smith. Winning six world championships, uh, you tend to just be isolated. John Smith's Cowboys are so dominant in this championship. And there's John Smith, who going into next season will be the longest tenured head coach in Division I. The Smiths are going crazy. The older brother syndrome on me, but uh, I'm catching up on him. Dell City, Oklahoma. Now living in Stillwater. Here we're looking at him right now. What a record he has had. Two world championships, one Olympic champion. You know, in the end, um, we moved forward as a program, and um, I'm pleased with uh, the season. I'm pleased with the Until the end of time in the sport of wrestling, John Smith will go down as one of the greatest wrestlers, coaches, and honestly mentors to ever step on the mat. He has touched lives in coaching across the world during his athletic milestones, and most importantly in Stillwater, Oklahoma. After the 2024 NCAA season, John Smith announced his retirement as the head coach from Oklahoma State. The future at the time might have been unclear for him, but as we take a walk down memory lane, his impact on thousands and maybe even millions of people will never go away. Yep. Right, at Oklahoma State. What's the transition been like for you over the last four to six oh, it's months? It's been great. Yeah. It's been great. You know, um, you know, my wife's from Oklahoma City area, uh, which has been awesome getting back close to the in-laws, which is, is nine years away. Um, you know, my kids, my, my older two were born there. Did, don't remember it too much, but um, getting them back with some old friends that we had had daycare with and stuff has been huge and some family friends that we've known for a very long time and people that have helped me through my career. During the summer, Oklahoma State would be losing longtime staff member and former Cowboy National Champ Zach Esposito, which caused a frenzy in not only Stillwater, Oklahoma, but the wrestling world in general. To go into a little bit more detail, Esposito was heading out to Colorado Springs, which that position opened up when freestyle star James Green decided to return back to competition. This left a huge opening in Oklahoma State, and the great Coleman Scott would gladly take it, which seemed like a really weird and an oddly perfect move all at the same time. Scott was already a head coach at North Carolina for a fair amount of years, turning that program into a routine All-American school and even earning a few individual national titles from Austin O'Connor. So many people asked why he would leave a head coaching position that he was doing fairly well at. Well, at the end of the day, it's really hard to turn down your alma mater, especially a program like Oklahoma State. Plus, with the rumors of John Smith possibly retiring every single year coming up, along with no one in the media really knowing what was said behind closed doors. Another very big key to know is that he was not going to be just another assistant coach under John Smith, but the associate head coach, which is a very key difference to notice. This move snowballed into more craziness that honestly doesn't affect the John Smith story too much, but for example, Coach Cole left Stanford that he built into a top 20 program for the North Carolina job, which is also his alma mater. Coach Aries left his longtime home of Prince for another academic powerhouse in Stanford that Coach Cole just left from. And then on top of 
all that quicker than you could say ride him cowboy Zach Esposito left his new job at Colorado Springs to get back into college coaching at NC State. Now to be honest what does all that have to do with the John Smith story? Well very little to be honest. However Coleman Scott is a key factor for one reason. It raised a lot of early season questions and it cranked the John Smith retirement questions up to an all-time high. Okay, Mom, stand up. <laughs> I'm going to introduce uh, my mother, mother of 10, Madeline Smith. John Smith came from a family of winners, which was a very large family in fact. The Smiths actually have one of the only four-time national champs in Pat Smith, John's younger brother. Then John's youngest brother Mark was also a several-time All-American for the family. John's oldest brother Leroy has gone record saying he really pushed John, resulting in a lot of fights. However, Leroy led the way for wrestling at Oklahoma State, opening the door for the family, and opening up wrestling for John to a whole new level. So it's Really easy to say the Smiths are a family of winners. I think the proof is in the sauce there with our hindsight glasses. I think the real interesting question is though, well, why? Well, John has gone on record saying how competitive his household was, not just between his older brother Leroy, but his entire family of 10 siblings. John was the youngest of the first seven siblings, and almost everyone and even his sisters in the families could wrestle with him. John has gone on record saying he could beat anyone in the country at his weight and age. Age, but his siblings would be really tough on him and being so young and competitive it really drove John for greatness at such a young age. With all that said there was still a lot of love within the family which I think is a true powerful functioning family. When there was a lot of tough love which they for sure had and a lot of care between all the members it creates something pretty special. Sort of like a strong wrestling team if you will. They all really loved each other and they all pushed each other for some form of greatness where they knew it or not. Ultimately, they create a winning family and one of the most winningest families ever to be seen on the wrestling mat. Those duck unders, a little pass bys, get a double leg. Um, there's that inside trip. out trip right to his back, looking for the fall. That's it. Fix with the fall. Fix five twenty eight with the kick down to his back. Oklahoma State started out their season pretty hot. They smoked a decently put together Bucknell team in the dual season opener, and they sent a ton of wrestlers to the Lindenwood Open, where they left with 15 tournament champions. Their big transfer from the offseason, Isaac Olenek, also proved himself very early in the season, winning his all-star match over a very tough Dean Hamidi, proving he was at least a contender to All-American again at the weight class. I, I went there, it was because of the coaches and uh, the room that they had, you know, a lot of young talent, uh, guys who are going to push yourself or push me. And, uh, you know, we have Braden Thompson, Dustin Platt, all around that way, you know, uh, a ton of other good freshmen who have prepared me for matches like this, you know, like I said, hard nose and uh, just Coach Perry, you know, being uh, the, the coach who came with me to, uh, today and you know, just the game plan. It's, it's another level. However, the doors of questions really opened up before, during, and after CKLV. Great opportunity for our guys. You know, got some, some young guys and older guys, sort of a split team. And um, it's a great place to see where you're at, you know, uh, have some great opportunities uh, individually, um, you know, to prove ourselves or, you know, stay, stay doing what we're doing. This was the first time in a long time the Cowboys would be attending the prestigious Cliff Keen Wrestling Tournament. Probably the toughest in-season D1 tournament and for sure the toughest during the 2024 season. Oklahoma State really showed their youth in their lineup during this stretch of the season. For starters, their golden boy Dayton Fix was not in the field already, giving Oklahoma State an uphill battle at CKLV. Their new transfer and the previous mention, Olenek, won an impressive field at 165 at CKLV 
but honestly besides his performance they would only capture two other placers and finish in ninth place which for a team like oklahoma state was a rough showing especially with teams like iowa and penn state not in the field but one thing to note oklahoma state was young not doomed for the rest of the season and as the season would continue to unfold this cklv performance would almost seem like an outlier for the oklahoma state cowboys as they would keep moving forward and keep looking better and better John Smith captured two national titles at 134 pounds in 1987 and 1988. No easy feat by any means, however non-wrestling fans might be curious. Why is John Smith always in the conversation for the GOAT of Wrestling, aka the greatest of all time, especially with there being several four-time NCAA champs now? Well in my opinion that is due to two huge factors. Those factors being during his world and Olympic journeys, and of course, with the creation of of the low single leg. Okay, when we talk about a low single leg, the, you know, there's no question. We're talking about penetrating below the knee. You know, one thing that you want to understand is that anytime you're penetrating to your knees, I mean, you better be in good position because it's it's easy for somebody to go around you. It's easy for somebody to score from a, from a defensive standpoint. So. Uh, it's real important that you, you, you technically get really sound at a low single leg before you start using it. Yeah, it's a little crazy to think that the low single leg was literally not a move until John Smith created it. However, once it was formed, he was practically unstoppable with the move. After losing in the national finals to future great Jim Jordan, John Smith decided to redshirt for the following year. The year prior to him losing to Jim Jordan was his freshman year. He would get upset pretty early in the NCAA tournament, resulting in him not placing for Oklahoma State, essentially making them lose the 1984 NCAA team title which then resulted in their coach being fired which john was really not a fan of silly things are done sometimes and i always say the most silliest thing thing that ever happened here at oklahoma state was we losing him as a coach and the choices that people made going undefeated taking second at nationals you come back to get fired um never sat well with me. On the other hand though, it created some weird butterfly effect. This redshirt period is where John Smith developed his low single leg, and once it hit the scene, it could not be stopped. At the Google Games in 1986 was when the world was really put on notice of John Smith and his low single. Time running out, there it is, there it is, great, great. First loss for the Soviet Union in 32 matches in the Goodwill Games and the youngest American. He would defeat Russia's starting man, literally taking him apart with a low single. And his incredible growth since the NCAA Finals loss was immaculate. I mean, he looked like a different person, essentially. This move led to so many great things in the sport of wrestling, but also John Smith's life. It literally altered his success and led him to some huge accomplishments. That, that literally, for those of you that know, it's, it's bought me everything. It's bought me my house. It's bought me my farm. It's bought me my other farm. It's bought me the cows. It's bought me my beautiful truck. The low single leg paid my way. However, despite all the success John had during his redshirt year on the international scene, he still was searching for an NCAA title. And of course, an NCAA title is something to be proud of, but there is a few more accomplishments that really puts John Smith in the greatest of all time discussion. For Oklahoma State fans, I'm sure seeing the team have a super poor showing at CKLV was less than ideal, especially with there being some new faces in the lineup. These new faces though were far from nobodies, with several of them being some of the highest ranked recruits in recent Oklahoma State memory. However, I'm not sure what Oklahoma State did after CKLV, but it was working, especially as the Cowboys embarked on their dual portion of the season. Taking Jamison filled in at 141 for Oklahoma State, and he was 
was a former Minnesota Gopher, but still a young transfer for Oklahoma State and staff. He beat several All-Americans throughout his season, like majoring Brock Hardy at CKLV, beating top-ranked Anthony Etchemendia during the Iowa State duel, and he won a very tough sudden victory match over two-time All-American Clay Carlson. As long as we do our jobs, then we have nothing to worry about because we have all the talent. We just got to have the right like mentality and attitude especially these tournaments. Teague Travis was a very interesting situation for them, being a former 141 pounder. He started the season as a 149, but after having some hiccups, he would bump up to 157, where he really started to fire up. He beat all Americans like Brock Mahler and Ed Scott, along with going on a seven match win streak midway through the season, which when you're mostly just doing duels is not very easy. Both of his Mahler and Scott wins also really helped the Cowboys take out top ranked teams like Missouri and North Carolina State. And I spent a lot of time in the weight room this summer and just kept getting bigger and bigger and just kind of filling out and matured more. And I was and I saw that the 57 spot was open and I was like, let's go go be the guy there. Travis Bump also led to the emergence of a huge recruit and freshman star Jordan Williams, who was talked about a lot climbing the high school ranks back in the day, but due to redshirt, the fuss was kind of quiet, especially since no one knew if he was even going to be the starter or not. And to be honest, he didn't have many great wins besides being teammates to earn the spot, along with securing a Lindenwood Open title. But he was a little bit of a late bloomer during the season, so his time to shine was for sure coming. The final young star was Brayden Thompson, who was a very interesting high school prospect. He was only interesting because he was beating senior level wrestlers at the US Open and trials two years before he even got to Oklahoma State. So he attracted a lot of college looks very early, but he ultimately went to Oklahoma State. He was another slow starter, which can be expected for a true freshman, but the development showed during different points in the season for sure. And the first time I even knew about, uh, you know, a cadet world team or a junior world team, it's always been like, you know, I want to be the best. I want to be the guy that represents USA. Overall though, Oklahoma State had a nice blend of upperclassmen like Fix and Plot to secure big wins on top of a strong young core to keep the tradition alive, ultimately accumulating in a 14-0 dual meet record, painted one of the most talked about dual meets year over year. Oklahoma State versus Iowa. at two in the morning, I'd go to Gallagher Iber Arena and I'd run stadiums. And that was the same time schedule the Russians were on. Exactly, and, and just to strengthen my mind, I was thinking, you know, while the Russians are sleeping, I'm working. John Smith got his claim to fame on the international circuit during his appearance at the Goodwill Games, which I guess was supposed to rival the Olympic and World Tournaments. For the most part during my research, that appears to be true, at least for the short lifespan of the event, but that's not real important to the big picture of John Smith. This event got John Smith's name into the eyes of the foreign competition, and most importantly in the eyes of the Russians, who as most Americans know were and still are a massive threat in the wrestling landscape having a lot of tradition and dominance in the field of freestyle wrestling. After winning the 1986 Goodwill Games in Moscow, John would look at the 1987 NCAA wrestling season, where he would finally capture his first NCAA title, taking out Jill Sanchez of Nebraska by a dominant margin. After these two large feats in the sport, everyone knew what was next for John. The 1987 World Championships. And this was the year prior to the Olympics, so usually a pretty stacked field as every country is preparing for the Olympic Games and the upcoming year. John Smith took no exception to getting ready for these World Championships, making his first world team and winning his first gold medal, starring his now historic World and Olympic runs. Like I said, this set him up to be the favorite heading in the Olympics. However, there was one familiar man staying in his way, the wrestling legend, Randy Lewis. Be ag aggressive, but uh, it's kind of counter aggressive. I'll let people in a lot on me and uh, like to create a lot of scoring opportunities. And uh, my matches, uh, when I do have tend to have close matches, they're usually not like one to one or two to two. They'll be more like uh, uh, 13 to 12 or something like that. We're at the end of the match. Lewis is going to win 7 18 to 12, but it was a dandy, Dave. Oh, an excellent match. And the clock. Minute and 12 there to go. It is, there it is. He's got it. That's the key. Technical superiority. He wins 24 to 11. 
and another gold medal for the USA, Randy Lewis. Randy Lewis was familiar to John Smith, not because they wrestled all the time or anything like that, but because Randy was the man who denied John Smith's older brother and longtime practice partner Leroy a chance to make the 1984 Olympic team in a very, very, very controversial fashion. So controversial, it made it all the way to court, forcing the two to re-wrestle a match with very minimal time left, giving Randy Lewis the spot. Now that same man was back, and this time trying to take out John Smith. However, even though Randy Lewis would put up an unexpected fight due to his age against John Smith, John was just at the peak of his power, and would come back to win and end the longtime rivalry between the Smiths and Randy Lewis. Time has run out. John Smith of the United States wins his fourth match. This one over Mika Leto of Finland, 16 to 6. John Smith would take the Olympic spot for Team USA, and as most know, he would go on to win his first Olympic gold medal, making it two straight gold medals in a row. John Smith would dominate on the freestyle scene for a long time, and he gained a lot of wisdom throughout. He would win the next three world championships and then cap off his amazing Olympic career with a second Olympic gold medal during the 1992 Olympic Games, making him the first and so far only American to win six gold medals in a row. The only American wrestler to date to win more than six gold medals is Jordan Burroughs. However, his were not consecutive. Either way, Team USA has to thank John Smith for what he did, because his six gold medals is still impacting the team today whether people know it or not. It's hard to go an Olympic cycle without hearing about John Smith's impact for Team USA and freestyle wrestling all over the world. He truly inspired thousands if not millions of people to start wrestling, to continue wrestling, or just better themselves. I think John Smith could have continued winning gold medals on the world and Olympic scene, but instead he decided to transition to coaching, which led to a whole nother beast for John Smith to conquer. She's getting ready for uh, Iowa Welcome State. Uh, you know, a match that uh, I've been a part of since uh, 1983, so it's been a long time. Um, I've got a lot of good memories and I got a lot of bad memories. At this, uh, at this duel coming up, are there particular weights that you think stand out, or is this just going to be a dog fight? Oh, I think it's, yeah, what you think, dog fight. I mean, it's, um, we got to have a great match. Maybe maybe the best team we've wrestled. Oklahoma State had a rocky start to the season with CKLV, but they really gained a stride with their balanced team during the dual portion of the season. Entering into the highly anticipated Iowa versus Oklahoma State duel, with Oklahoma State having a record of 14-0. Iowa, on the other hand, had a solid team, kind of similar to Oklahoma State, but during their Big Ten schedule, they took some lumps. You gotta perform better, we know that. Onward, forward. Looking ahead. They lost to Michigan pretty bad with no toss-ups really going their way. They also got punished by Penn State, but who didn't during the 2024 season? So when most were doing whiteboard wars during this duel, it really could have went any way. However, heading into the break, the duel did not look very good for Oklahoma State. I would win toss-up after toss-up, really taken out of John Smith's Cowboys hands. With the final duel score being 22-9, with the Cowboys only getting three wins with veterans Fix and Plot, and then youngster Jordan Williams, who was really coming alive at this point in the season. Looking like he basically won the spot outright here, actually being an Oklahoma State transfer, Victor Voinovich, who now wrestled for Iowa. At the end of the day, though, I think Oklahoma State also needed this loss. Just need to grow up a little bit, learn some lessons from it, and go kick ass in the Big 12. Of course, they probably wanted to go undefeated in duels, but sometimes is what a team needs before all the marbles are graded during the postseason. Because Oklahoma State would now look ahead to the Big 12 Championships, and of course, the NCAA Tournament. Ryan faced Pat Smith, the number one seed and defending champ from Oklahoma State. Alongside on his right, brother John, recently honored with the James Sullivan Award as the top amateur athlete of the year.
John Smith exited his competitive career as a champion. I mean, from 1986 to 1992, he didn't do much losing, especially on the big stage. But now with his competitive shoes hung up, there was only one thing left to do. Prove himself on the coaching scene, and there was only one real place in consideration. John Smith's alma mater, Oklahoma State. He would officially start as head coach in 1992, and he would actually be the coach for his younger brother, Pat. Pat Smith, and for those who don't know, Pat Smith was the first ever four-time national champion, winning titles in 1990, 91, 92, and then in 94. Come the first wrestler ever to win four NCAA championships. Not even John accomplished that. Right now, he's got the older brother syndrome on me, but uh, I'm catching up on him. However, John's first two years as head coach were for sure filled with controversy and adversity all rolled into one. For starters, John would have a star-studded team in 1992, but they would fall just short to the Iowa Hawkeyes in the team race, finishing in second place. Some of the wrestlers for the Cowboys include the previous mentioned Pat Smith, winning his third NCAA title, and a handful of NCAA runner-ups like Alan Freed, Chris Owens, and Todd Chesbro, just to name a few. So the Cowboys had a nice blend of finalists in 1992, but the real problem started during John's second season as head coach as the Cowboys would be on a year suspension which could have really killed the program for years to come and there's some controversy there of course OSU went on probation at one point and uh, almost got the death penalty but it was a whole laundry list of violations not any one thing that was just devastatingly bad but just so many of uh, rules that were broken. Apparently there was an NCAA policy violation which at the end of the day banned them from competition in 1993 at the NCAA championships, which was a real blow for them especially coming off a second place team finish. I'll say this, uh, it wasn't easy for Coach C. Yeah, it wasn't easy. Um, Carrying, a, uh, uh, carrying the tradition, um, the, a, level, a level of expectation. Um, you know, can you imagine the expectation if your coach gets fired and went undefeated and took second in the nation? I mean, what am I supposed to do? Luckily though, for Oklahoma State and especially John Smith, the program has a long-standing tradition because the program basically beat the odds and came back for the 1994 season better than ever. Pat Smith would win his fourth national title, which once again, he became the first ever wrestler to do so, while also helping his team to an NCAA championship, giving John Smith his first NCAA team title as head coach. To be honest, to do this after a year's suspension is not easy. I would argue it's almost impossible to do. I think the combination of faith within the program, long-standing traditions, and having one of the best coaches ever really helped create a perfect storm during a very adverse time. In my honest opinion, I think the 1994 team title is one of the most well-earned by any team in NCAA history. your uh, take so far on you know, the tournament? Um, you know, we didn't, we by no means, I mean, we didn't lose the tournament. Iowa State won it, you know. Um, scored a lot of points, you know, if you told me we was going to score in the 140s, I, I would told you we won the tournament, we're going to win it, you know. After the Iowa duel, speculation for the Cowboys were well, super unclear. They obviously weren't the best tournament team based on their CKLV run, but if you looked at some of the Big 12 matchups for them, they were really in a good spot. For starters, besides Kakaizen for you and I, Plot was more than likely going to beat everyone in the field at 184 for Big 12s. Dayton Fix was going for his fifth Big 12 title, and some of the young wrestlers were in nice spots in the bracket to at least, well, hopefully keep the Cowboys in the hunt. Another key to know is that a lot of Oklahoma State fans thought the Iowa loss 
couldn't have happened at a better time. It left a bad taste in Oklahoma State. Happened about two weeks before the conference tournament, so nice timing to get better. And usually well-run teams can rebound well from those occurrences. As we fast forward to the end result, yes, Oklahoma State did not come out victorious, but they really outshined expectations. For starters, they were in a back and forth battle with eventual champs Iowa State. Uh, it was a great, great night, great two day uh, effort for us. You know, we had all 10 guys score points. And, you know, in an individual sport, when you get this much team corrupt com camaraderie, you really can get some momentum. And I think that's what happened this weekend. And this battle happened all weekend with a lot of twists and turns. And that was for a few reasons. Oklahoma State would get four wrestlers in the finals and all 10 would place top six or higher, which in NCAA and covered scoring is big points. On top of all that, Oklahoma State would secure five-time Big 12 champion in Dayton Fix. Jordan Williams would also get a massive upset, taking out future All-American Casey Sudersky of Iowa State, giving the Cowboys big unexpected points there at 149. So you're going into your first finals of your first postseason. What's going through your head? You seem pretty calm right now. I mean, another match. I mean, I'm not going to make it too big. I'm not going to overlook it. Just keep going at the pace and... uh. Yeah, I'm going that. Troy Spratley also had a nice run in the heavy varied 125. I guess to start, Troy, just kind of what does it mean for you to be a big co finalist? Uh, feels great, but uh, I think this is what we came here to do. Uh, we were looking to put all of us in the finals. I mean, I feel like we worked hard enough in the room to uh, put all 10 of us, but you know, it just hadn't happened like that. And uh, you know, I had to go out and get a win for my team. Along with Isaac Olenek finishing in third and probably the toughest conference bracket in the country. How, what are your thoughts on how far the team has progressed from last year's Big 12 championship? To yeah, well, a lot. You know, it just just attitude, winning tough, tight matches. I mean, even here uh, this week, I mean, we had a lot of tough matches that we we had to get through and, and win, and um, you know, that's the difference. Like I said, Iowa State would be victorious, but if this tournament showed anything, it was Oklahoma State was more of a tournament team than most people thought. And everyone knew you only need a few All-Americans to slip into that top two spot, especially during the 2024 season with the race for second being very deep and Oklahoma State had some firepower to do it. All they would really need to do is get a couple guys in the semis and just a few in the finals and they could for sure take home a team trophy. So Oklahoma State with their third consecutive NCAA wrestling title. And on top of all that, they had five wrestlers also win individual championships. So congratulations to the Cowboys for a dominating performance. So John Smith won his first coaching national title in 1994 and helped his brother win his fourth national title along with a star-studded team. However, it took John Smith and staff quite a few years before they started humming in the top spot again. There, of course, was the Iowa Hawkeyes who were always battling with, well, everyone. But the true competitor in the early 2000s was honestly the Minnesota Gophers, who was one of the few teams in that era or, well, ever to take out Iowa. In 2001, Oklahoma State took third behind Iowa and Minnesota. Minnesota actually became the first and only team to secure 10 All-Americans, but no finalists to win the national championships. This was enough to give Minnesota that team title with no finalists, so clearly that was a big blow to Iowa and Oklahoma State, who had some national champions that year even, but no team national title. Minnesota would win it back-to-back -back years, securing the top spot in 2002 as well, with Oklahoma State not even finishing in the top four that year. A place like Oklahoma State can be stressful sometimes, especially when you're not winning at the highest peak. So there for sure was some pressure on John Smith at the time. However, as the years went on, the dominoes started to fall in the right direction for the university and the Cowboy wrestling team. In 2003, Oklahoma State took out the top dog of the early 2000s, the Minnesota Gophers, by a landslide, winning by almost 40 points with only two national champs, but they did have seven All-Americans. One of those All-Americans for John Smith was the young Chris Pendleton. The difference between confidence and arrogance is really small because some of the most arrogant people I know are some of the most confident people I know. And I'm not saying being arrogant might not be a bad thing. I try to, I try to stay humble 
I have a good support system around me. For those who don't know, Chris Pendleton was one of the biggest staples during the John Smith 2000 era, and he is a very, very pivotal piece in his coaching tree, but we'll get back to Mr. Pendleton very soon. Minnesota, Oklahoma State, and Iowa were all massive staples in the wrestling landscape during the early to mid 2000s. However, if there is any person to point to during this time, there was the Missouri Tigers' Ben Askren, looking to win his first national title as a redshirt freshman. However, there was one man staying in Askren's way, the Oklahoma State star, Chris Pendleton. Number two, Ben Askren, the defending Big 12 champ, and they met last year here, Askren the winner, and then Pendleton won at the NCAAs. It seems like they wrestle one another every week. Ben Askren's, you know, he's somebody that I have to beat to win another national title this year. He's somebody I had to beat last year to win a national title. You know, of course he makes it better because that's what I'm training for is to win the national title, and he's who I have to get through to win the national title. So do it right here. Well, they... Chris Pendleton back as Big 12 champ as he takes care of Ben Askren, 12-8 at 174 pounds. What truly made Askren so special to the wrestling community was his unorthodox style, which was honestly revolutionary at the time, basically starting the modern day funk that we all love so much. Pendleton and Askren wrestled a multitude of times with every match differing drastically. I personally think John Smith's coaching ability really shined during this rivalry. Yes, he did have an amazing athlete in Pendleton to pull it off, but I think John Smith's coaching is what ultimately helped Chris Pendleton at the end of the day always take out the great Ben Askren. And the Cowboys go three for three. Good job, guys. Hey, don't do that. What's in here? John Smith's Cowboys are so dominant in this championship. Do you think Askren's going to look forward to next year without Pendleton and Askren's last match was pretty iconic on its own for the national stage, but it not only marked Pendleton becoming a two-time national champion, but it marked something else very special for John Smith and Oklahoma State. They became one of the few teams ever to obtain five individual national champions en route to their national title. That's right, John Smith had Chris Pendleton, who was their only champion in 2004 when they dominated the field, Zach Esposito at 149, who would continue a long coaching career at Oklahoma State with John Smith, Johnny Hendricks, who was the man for the Cowboys at the time and eventually became a UFC champion. And then they would go on to win back-to-back -back weights at 197 with Jake Rochel, who won a national title back in the infamous 2003 season that got Oklahoma State back on track. And then of course, there was the Iowa transfer and legendary wrestler Steven Mako at heavyweight. These five names will never be forgotten in Stillwater or the wrestling community in general, because as of today, they are Oklahoma State's and John Smith's only five champ team, winning the 2005 NCAA title by 70 points over the second place team, Michigan. John Smith's final season was a roller coaster, so let's recap really fast. His longtime assistant leaves for the Olympic Training Center job. He gains back an Olympic medalist and national champion for him to be a part of the coaching staff and Coleman Scott. They have a great dual season besides dropping a match to longtime rivals Iowa. They had a bad tournament showing without Dayton Fix in Vegas, but their Big 12 showing clearly showed that their ideal lineup was here and definitely in the hunt for a team trophy. All of these factors came together to give a six-time Olympic and world gold medalist, a five-time NCAA team champ coach, and a coach of a five champ NCAA team in the great John Smith heading into his final NCAA tournament. All while not a single person knew it would be his last NCAA run. So let's dive into it. The Oklahoma State Cowboys 2024 NCAA wrestling tournament led by John Smith. You talked about how favorable some of the draws were for some of the guys. Which, what are some of the matches and the brackets that? Oh, I didn't favorable. I just say the more 
I liked some of the seeds that we got, you know. I thought that's where we were going to end up, and several of them. And, uh, our draws are tough, you know. I mean, um, we might have uh, a couple that we have an opportunity to maybe squeeze out some bonus points. Uh, I don't think it's going to be any different than Big 12. You know, we're going to have to win tough matches. We've got a lot of, uh, you know, we've got four freshmen, and, and they're going to have to go win tough matches. Heading into the 2024 NCAA tournament, there was for sure one storyline. Well, two, I guess. Penn State was going to run away with the first place trophy, and the race for second was going to be legendary, with no joke 10 or more teams having a serious shot to get it done. The biggest factor for the team that wanted to take second was of course high placers and a lot of them. But to be fair, the backside wrestling really determined the second place team in 2024. To give a little away early, the second place team didn't even have the second most All-Americans behind Penn State. They actually only had three and one finalist, which is wild to consider they took second. However, it really goes to show that it came down to bonus points on the backside of the bracket. However, this is an Oklahoma State story, and more importantly, a John Smith story. Everyone saw how they competed at Big 12s, and despite not winning the event, it was a pretty impressive showing by the Cowboys. But the veterans would have to do their thing, and the young up-and-comers would need to perform at one of, if not the highest stress tournament in the world. What was your expectation of your bracket and, and what does it feel like to be the number one? Um, you know, it doesn't really matter at all. Uh, it's just places to be in the bracket. Uh, I gotta win five matches and it doesn't matter who, I'll, who I'm wrestling, I'm gonna go out there and you know, put a complete focus into each one and you know, score as many points as I can and, and get my hair rinsed. From an unbiased standpoint, I think Oklahoma State came out of the gates pretty hot. Troy Spratley won his opening match at a pretty wild and inconsistent 125 weight, where there was for sure more than a few upsets early on. Dane Fix and Dustin Plott start out on fire at 133 and 184, both securing tech falls which are massive bonus points for your team. Other nice wins but expected wins were Olejnik at 165 and Doucette at heavyweight. Travis at 157 also beat multiple time All-American Brock Mahler of Missouri to prove his win from the season was not a fluke. Jordan Williams had an unfamiliar Hawkeye in Caleb Ratchin. Similar to Williams' Big 12 run, this match was exciting, with Williams coming from behind late to secure the win for the Cowboys. However, amidst all the positivity, there was still some downfall moments. The Cowboys punched 7 of 10 into the second round, however that means 3 of their wrestlers would lose their opening matches, which to be honest wasn't a horrible ratio. On the other hand, the 3 wrestlers that lost round 1 also dropped their second round match going 0-2 at the tournament, and as stated before, the race for second would need some backside warriors. So at the time it didn't seem like that big of a deal, but when we put our hindsight glasses on, it left a massive impact for future rounds to come. What's it been like for you being back at this event with Orange on? Ah, it's great. You know, it's it's what I started in, you know, 2005, I, I guess, um, was first one. And, um, you know, it, it just, with the fan base and the expectation, right, what we expect to win, we expect to have guys in the finals, we expect to have multiple All-Americans, you know, and, um, you know, I, I just, it, it's home for me, and, and uh, it, you know, and, and that changed in 2004 when I moved there, and they made it home for me. Day one of NCAAs really only means one thing, and that's find out how many wrestlers you could take into day two, where the real points start to fly. No one ever wins nationals on day one, but they can for sure set themselves up for success. I would say Oklahoma State had a lot of bulletin into this second session, but once Oklahoma State found this second round, they had to really dig deep all tournament, because it was not smooth sailing. I don't really pay too much attention to what what other guys are doing, you know, they, they, they need to prepare for me, uh, 
you know, and a lot of guys do that. You know, they, they always have some kind of game plan that, that they're going to have, and then they can do that. You know, if they're worried about me, then, then that's their problem. To be honest, Spratly looked really impressive gaining another win over Virginia Tech's Cooper Flynn at 125 setting himself up for a rematch versus Drake Al of Iowa, who he only lost to in a very tight match during the duel. And Al for sure looked vulnerable throughout the season, so a really winnable All-American match. But on the flip side of the coin, he really only needed to win one more match to become an All-American. Looking at your bracket, you likely have a guy that you had in the quarterfinals last year in the second round. Did you look back at that match at all and you know, kind of thought about any of that? So I know it's a short turnaround, but... No, I mean, of course I've thought about it. I've seen the bracket, but uh, first match is really all that matters. In Nationals, you never know what's going to happen. That is a matchup I, of course, uh, would really like to get back and uh, wrestle against him again, but uh, just taking it one match at a time. At 184, Dustin Plott also kept the smooth train rolling for his NCAA run, gaining a major decision to enter into the quarterfinals. But he would set himself up to face multiple time All American Bernie Truax of Penn State in the morning session of day two. So, not a very favorable draw by any means, but we'll get to that match soon. However, besides Spratly and Plot, Oklahoma State could not have had a more polar opposite round compared to the morning. For starters, Fix would have a slight scare to young Ohio State Buckeye Nick Buzakis, only winning 5-4. Then besides their three round two winners, Oklahoma State would drop their other four matches in this round. The most troubling defeat at the time was probably Kamamina Michigan over Oleznik at 165. A deep weight like 165 during the 2024 season was already tough enough, so dropping a match in round two was less than ideal, considering the path the loser of this match would have to take to even All-American. And it especially was not good from a team standpoint, with more than a few wrestlers already being eliminated for the Cowboys before day two leaving John Smith's Oklahoma State team with seven wrestlers entering into the halfway mark of the tournament. Now to be a positive voice of reason, Oklahoma State still had three quarter finalists obviously. With all of them having at least a shot of winning their match to become an All-American in that semifinal spot, and some of them probably had fair wads hanging in as well. And they had four wrestlers battling on the backside of the bracket. Compared to other teams battling for that second place spot, it was pretty similar to all of them. And as stated previously, no team gets a trophy on day one, it's all about what you do on day two. In day three. John, this is for you. Nobody's coached in this tournament longer than you have. What keeps you going? And the fact that it isn't here in Oklahoma, does it motivate you more? I know you're getting ready to build a new facility on campus, that type of thing. What keeps you going? Well, I just enjoy the sport and I enjoy uh, coaching. Um, I think uh, your experiences, what motivates you, whether they're good or bad. And, um, 
for, for me. Uh, been been two of the probably most challenging years I've had in the last couple of years. You know, you, you, you'd rather have those early in your career than at the end, towards the end of your careers, but uh, it's just kind of the way it fell and, and the things that we had to kind of pick up and, and keep moving. And so, um, you know, I don't think you have a plan to coach this long. I just think it happens. Um, I've enjoyed Oklahoma State. Uh, Oklahoma State's uh, been good to me and good, been good to my family. And I think for a lot of reasons you stay with it. Uh, but it, that's definitely one is that you, got, you have support from your institution, your athletic department, your athletic director, and it makes a big difference in how long you, you, you want to coach. Day two started out somewhat hot for the guys on the backside. Olejnik, Travis, Doucette, and Williams all won their opening matches to stay alive. They still needed to win two more to All-American, but for guys like Williams to get bonus and the others to just stay alive was still a must for Oklahoma State. On the other hand though, on the top side of the bracket, the wheels were for sure starting to shake. Spratly would fall to the blood round after dropping another sudden victory match to Drake Ayala of Iowa. And to really add insult to injury, Ayala would go on to make the national finals at the weight class. Dan Fix will win his first tight sudden victory match. For whatever reason, the crowd really started to turn against Dayton Fix at this point. I don't know if it was the way he was wrestling, which to be honest, people were game playing him like crazy this tournament. They need to prepare for me. Uh you know, and a lot of guys do that. You know, they, they always have some kind of game plan. But either way, to see a five-time All-American get booed from this point on the tournament was kind of sad. And to be fair, it could have been on the officials as well, because I swear every match he wrestled this tournament, there was some controversial call.
However, despite the shakiness of Spratly and Fix's match, Dustin Plot once again did his job and got a massive bonus point win over a very tough Bernie Truax of Penn State. Winning 16-6, putting on a clinic to earn his next All-American honor. So for those who are not keeping track or don't know how the bracket system works, the Cowboys now have two top six finishers and five guys still alive in their brackets. However, the wheels would continue to shake throughout the rest of this session, as Olegnik and Spratly were the only two wrestlers left to All-American with everyone else falling a few rounds short. These two were in the dreaded blood round where they had to win one more match to become All-Americans, and to be honest, the pain was not over yet. Another tight one for Dayton. Is that a matter of him wrestling that kid oh, so many I times? Just this think, year? I just think, yeah. I think part of it is didn't finish those single legs. He was on the leg seven times. He had a single leg seven different times. Didn't get didn't get to his high crotch, but needs to finish those single legs tonight. Bradley had another tight match. Oh, you know they could have gave him they could have gave him points in there. I was a little disappointed that they didn't give him a three-point takedown, you know. And then uh, I, th I didn't think he had uh, uh, the three-point takedown in uh, overtime, you know. They, they, uh, yeah. Competed well. Spratly would lose to upset kid Tanner Joran of South Dakota State, who went on a very significant run on the backside for the Jackrabbits, but unfortunately it ended Spratly's season. Olegnik on the other hand had an opponent he's wrestled before, in the Wisconsin Badger, Dean Hamity. For those who don't remember, he beat Hamity at the All-Star Classic. However, very early into this blood round match, it did not look very good for the Cowboy. I mean, you know, I wanted it the hard way, you know, and uh, I don't know anything, anything else really. So knowing that he's got a real kind of funky style and um, he was kind of taking it to me first couple periods, maybe period and a half. And then and I was able to find my offense and kind of stop him from what he wanted to do. And ultimately, you know, kind of get that takedown and, and some victory and, and win. So, you know, I, I wouldn't have had it gone any other way. You know, that's... 165 pounds is a tough weight class, you know, when you're wrestling a guy who's two-time All-American, you know, in a blood round, uh, you know, couldn't ask for anything else. But Olegnik would dig deep to earn himself his second All-American honor, and winning one more match during his day two run to give the Cowboys three All-Americans in total, all in the top six. With Fix and Plot entering their semi-final match, with a bid to the finals on the line. Okay, we have with us now um, in the 133-pound championship, uh, Dayton Fix from Oklahoma State. Dayton, when you're comfortable, if you could start us off with some general comments about your semifinal match. Um, you know, no comments really. Uh, caught my hand raise. You know, that's my job, and I got to do what I got to do.
Okay, we've got uh, Dustin Plott with us now from Oklahoma State um, from the 184-pound championship match tomorrow evening. Dustin, if you could just get us started with some general comments about your semifinal match. My semifinals match, I uh, wrestled pretty well, wrestled like myself, so that's always, I'm always grateful to get to go do that. Uh, competed hard, tough opponent, but was able to get the job done, so I'm super grateful. Again, Fix would win a very tight match, but also very controversial as well, setting himself up with a rematch though, versus the man who knocked him out of the running last year and out of the Olympic trials finals in 2021, Vito Arujal. That situation with five seconds to go. And in his first senior world championship at 61 kilograms, the United States with a world champion, Vito Arugia. He now has a legacy. His father, a world champion for the Soviet Union in the 90s. And now Vito Arugia adding to the gold medal in the Arugia family. Paul would once again major his opponent, which is not easy to do in the NCAA semifinals, beating Salazar of Minnesota, who was also the Big Ten champion that year. However, he would also see a familiar foe, kind of similar to Dane Fix's situation, that wrestler being Parker Kakaizen, the all-year number one for UNI, who also beat Plot in the Big 12 championships. It's uh, Parker's great competitor, right? He's one of the best in the country overall, and um, I think, and I know I am, and, and Dustin is looking for another opportunity, right? Because he was not happy nor satisfied with what happened last time, and um, it'll be different. These two guys know each other very well, seated at first and third here at 184, and Kekajin dominant at this weight, only bonus point wins in his four matches here to the finals. And so, so is Plot. Yep. Plot is To be honest, Plot put up a pretty good fight in the NCAA Finals, but Kakaizen was just his heel all season. Overall, Plot put together a great national tournament, but just failed to reach the top, and he clearly put in the minds of everyone that he's the easy second best guy at 184. You know, defending world champion, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to it. You know, obviously, uh, it didn't go my way last time, and I've been, you know, thinking about it for you know a whole year now and you know I want to get that match back and what better stage to do it on than one on Saturday night. Then of course there was Fix versus Arujao, which to most was one of the most anticipated finals of this NCAA tournament, which somehow turned to one of the worst matches of the NCAA finals. But to be fair, it was to no fault of the wrestlers. And a challenge break thrown from the Oklahoma hey, Rob, State that's, that's a lot of hands. That's a lot of hands, Rob. Was it? Was that's it? A lot of hands. I didn't see it. From my angle, I, I just saw the back. So yeah, we, we need saw to the be back. After review, technical violation, yep. locked hands. There it is. It was on that far end. That might have been a takedown, boys. These challenges. And here yeah, comes the brick. Might, that might hey, be a takedown. This might be the longest NCAA final in history. We <laughs> got think, bricks. We yeah. got blood time. We got technical violations. No takedown. We saw the continuous motion, and that's why there was no takedown. However, and now the challenge brick thrown they call from the Oklahoma now, State corner now, on the takedown. But now this is a takedown, regardless. This is a takedown, right, Rock? Uh, this is this is getting to a point where, uh, <laughs> to me, it looks like it's adjusting the riding time. I heard him say one seconds. It's All one. Right, so let's see what happens here. Still stall call. No take. See what I'm wow. saying? Sure is the winner on the edge. The ref saying wave it off. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that, one was, that, one, that one wasn't a takedown. I agree. I agree. Good way. 15 seconds to go for yeah, a title Vito. at 133. Vito just got it. Vito just has to back up. He doesn't have The NCAA challenge process is one of the most talked about conversations in wrestling, and it will be for a while because you need challenges in sports. I think the biggest flaw to point at is the time it takes to make a second ruling. However, Oklahoma State would win every challenge during the Fix vs. Rougeau final, but all it really did was slow down the match and say Fix a few points here or there. And they have to go back and make the changes. You know, we, we uh, had to throw the throw uh, question two calls, and we got them both back. But kind of went against us. I mean, the crowd kind of went against us. Then he hits us with stalling. I mean, when we take the shot. But ultimately, Vito was on a mission for his second national title. He has nothing. It doesn't matter. He's got to just take his time. is the national champion here in Kansas City. This defeat left Fix as a four-time NCAA runner-up and a five-time All-American. You know, for how much he was booed this weekend, looking back, I bet a lot of people wish he would have won. What is, what is your time at Oklahoma State meant to you? It's probably a, a little too early to fully encapsulate it now, but what's it kind of meant to you? Uh, I've said it a million times, you know, I love Oklahoma State. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Uh, it's been a dream come true to put on that orange thing. Um, you know, I'm just very thankful for everything that they've done for me. And, uh, I just hope that I made, made them proud. But he truly had an impact on the program of Oklahoma State. I mean, he's their only five-time All-American ever and that record will probably always stand and of course we know he left an unforgettable impact on john smith's final season you guys have those name plates in the locker room of all the all americans with the different plate meaning a different number of times isn't it dayton's the first five times does he get his own plate you, know, you guys thought I that far he's gonna have to yeah he'll get his own plate yeah <laughs> yeah that'd be uh, pretty cool yeah, it is cool. Oklahoma State didn't have a national champ this year, or a team trophy, but they for sure had a proud run on top of another top 10 season finish in that 10th place spot. Ultimately, the 2024 season ended John Smith's coaching career on a high, and to most, I don't think they would take that perspective away from this season. But from having such a young team, plot moving up a weight class, and fix find a way back into the national finals after a fourth place finish, I think it was a fun and successful year for Coach John Smith. Program is, you know, 100, 100 plus years and, uh, and you're setting records. Well, that's, that's the quality of people that we're dealing with uh, on our team. Guys that are going to get better. The future looks bright. Uh, not only the, the guys that are in the room, the guys that are coming in. So uh, this, this team kind of helped us get back in, in a direction that we needed to go in from the last two seasons. To get a little personal at the end of this to honor Coach Smith, I really only have this to say. I did a lot of research on John Smith through his young life, his college career, his Olympic career, and of course his coaching career. He has accomplished a lot. And that is a huge understatement. However, after researching this past season of 2024, it really was a success for the Cowboys, despite the results. Coach Smith improved veterans, young athletes who will become stars, and he inspired the wrestling community. He is truly a pro in every sense of the word. And sometimes success isn't about the wins and losses, but it is about making everyone you touch become better after your interaction. And from the day he entered the wrestling room until he retired in 2024 from his drill partners to student athletes and to even his opponents he inspired them all to be better i got to be a part of something that was incredible i got to be a part of a legacy i got to be part of a, something that when you get your ass knocked down it's a lot easier to get up because of the, the program around you you know um, a lot easier. 
Um, and I, I would say that um, we were fortunate this year that we had the success of our program over the long, over the long years. We were fortunate. Uh, this team uh, this year was one of my most satisfaction, or most satisfying I've ever been as a coach, knowing what I got and then seeing what they did. And seeing what they did. And what they did is they wrapped their arms around uh, they wrapped their arms around Oklahoma State wrestling, and it took them all to another level. And not everybody has that, you know. I damn sure didn't start that. I sure helped to keep it, but I didn't start it. And so um, I feel really blessed that this whole, my whole career here as, as a young kid, as a student athlete, and as a coach, uh, I really feel blessed that I was, I'm part of something that I get to always be a part of.